I need your help this morning. Tell me what first comes to mind. Out loud. You tell me this out loud. When I say the word anniversary. Okay, yeah, that's what. There, it, anniversary is associated with a lot of words. There's a, words. There's an anniversary for your first day at work. The anniversary of the first time you made an A in school. A, there's a lot of anniversaries. But this world and our culture has co-opted that word to almost always make me at least think first of weddings. What is your wedding anniversary? And there's a lot to that. Now, it might just simply be because we're thinking about weddings an awful lot in our family right now. And as a part of thinking about those weddings, Brenda got out our photo album from our wedding many years ago. I didn't realize it had been so long since I looked at that. I, I learned lots of things to be embarrassed about <laughs> that I've for, totally forgotten. Wow, you should have seen how I was styling that day. Oh, the tuxes we wore back in those days. There's a lot of things worth forgetting, but it was also fun just to remember things. So while I did forget about a bunch of those pictures, I have never forgetten, forgotten about what perhaps my favorite picture from our wedding day. Now, I've shared this with you before, but here it is. The things I've always loved about this picture, I still love, but there are a few new ones. Like, I did have color in my hair at one point. Proof positive right there. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of things I like about this picture. You see the color of my hair. It shows my best side. You also see how beautiful the bride I married was then and still is today. So there's a lot of beauty. But here's my favorite part of this picture. I mean, the, many of you know Brenda pretty well, and you know me pretty well. Who got the good deal that day? But yet it looks like she's saying she got the good deal. You know, I got him. You know, I'm, I love that because we all know better than that, right? We know better who got the deal that day. So I, I love... I love, love, love this, this picture. Um, there is a sad story that, that is associated with this that is very true. It's embarrassing, but true. So when Brenda said she would go out with me on a date, and then the second date, and continue dating, I was going, wow, this beautiful blue-eyed, blonde-haired girl likes me. And so I was trying to decide whether to propose to her or not. Duh. The question wasn't if, whether, whether I was going to ask. The question was, what was she going to answer? But uh, I can remember vividly thinking, hey, if Brenda, Brenda McCrary likes me this much, maybe other girls would find me attractive. Maybe I need to re-enter the playing field just to see what could happen. I thought about that for two seconds and then got it out of my head because I just remembered the last nine girls who I'd tried to ask out that said no. And... I mean, just take a look at her. I mean, why would I walk away from that? And I am, I'm here to tell you, I was smart then, and I'm still smart today. She's sitting right up there. You can talk to her. I, swear, I warned her that I was going to tell this story. So, but, it, you know, of course I wasn't going to leave. And on that day many, many years ago, what happened and in the years that followed is exactly what God intended for those who marry. Paul quoted scripture in saying in Ephesians 5.31, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And that's what happened. Very quickly, it was not me or mine anymore. It became the us and the ours. And... And it's hard for me to think about my name without thinking of hers, or her name without thinking of mine. I mean, Kent and Brenda, Brent and Kenda, <laughs> Brent and Kenda. <laughs> See? You can even switch the, the letters around and it works. So uh, you just think, it, we, we're together. We, we truly are a one. And when Paul is quoting this verse and making the point, though, the point was not about my wedding or yours or any other one. The point was about each one of us and our relationship with Christ. And he says, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. His whole point is how we have this relationship as Christians, as believers, when we're baptized, this relationship with Christ where the two become one. 
we truly are, the Bible talks about it many times, we are the bride of Christ. We are in covenant relationship with him. We are no longer two, but we are one. And I would love to tell you the rest of the, the whole story about how I first heard about Brenda. Our first meeting, our, uh, how, our first dates. Actually, I'd rather not tell you about those because they're very embarrassing. But you have my permission to, to ask Brenda about them, and she will be truthful. But I just don't want to be there. Because let's just say I was not as cool as a cucumber during that whole process. It's, it's truly embarrassing. But like cucumbers, which give me indigestion, I get indigestion whenever I hear that story. But you talk to her. But I do have a story to tell. And it is a favorite story of mine to tell. I have preached this message before, if you've been around long, and I will preach it again. Because this is a story I love to tell. And I think it speaks powerfully to us. You see, there was a time in my life that I can't even remember when it began where somebody introduced me to Jesus. Now, I'm one of those blessed people, maybe some of you are as well, that literally grew up, what do they call it, grow up in the church? I grew up in the church building and in the church. And so from the earliest of ages, I was introduced to God and to Jesus. I, I truly cannot remember a time that I didn't know about that. And so early in my life, my parents, my family, teachers, a Christian family, a church, taught me about Jesus. And I heard. Some of you heard later. Somebody told you and tried to introduce you to Jesus. Or maybe you were just wondering and said, there's got to be more to life. And you, you heard about the Bible and opened it up. And you read the story and you learned about Jesus. There is a time in each of our lives where we get to introduced to God and to Christ. Romans 10, 17 puts it this way. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Aren't you thankful for those of us who are Christians that we got to meet, got to hear about and learn about God? But as we learned about him, there came a time where we had to make a decision. And I, like many of you, decided that I was in love with, with Jesus and wanted to live with him forever. And we decide that we're no longer going to be who we are, but we are going to be his. And that comes with a public confession. Matthew 10 puts it this way. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. And with that confession, as Christ is Lord, comes a change. We've been living one way, and we repented of that, and we decide to live a different way. Peter described it beautifully in Acts 2.38 when he said, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then we were baptized. 1 Peter 3, 21 says, This water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that took us out of those waters of baptism and made us pure and whole like we had never sinned. And we entered into this covenant relationship with God. Wow. That was a significant day for those of us who are Christians to remember. Now, one of the first memorable days in our lives has got to be our first day in this world. So, in, help me out here. In full voice, tell me your birthday. All right, so now, with full voice, out loud, everybody, tell me how old you are. I heard a bunch of young voices. Some of us were counting up. <laughs> All right, so maybe not many, as many of you know your actual age, but you know your birthday. Those are memorable days. Now, once again, one more question. What's the date of your baptism? So... Here's my point. Now listen, track with me for just a second. There were not as many answers, I think, was what you heard. But here's, there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, not, not all of us are Christians. And so not all of us have been baptized into Christ. So if you're listening to this message, listen with open ears because I think God wants to speak to you in a powerful way. We're going to describe what it means to live with him and for him and to fall short, but how he still treats us. Another reason is... 
Some of us don't remember the date of our birth. I occasionally will send messages to my kids on the day of their baptism because it's a significant day. But I don't remember to do it every year. I don't do it every year. That doesn't mean that wasn't a significant day. You know, we remember the story of Nicodemus to be born again. And so many people look at that as their second birthday. And I, I, I can see why. It's a significant, significant day. Of course, if I were to ask everybody that's married to tell me the anniversary of your marriage, I imagine you would hear a lot of voices and many of them would be female. I know people, most of them men, who can't remember their anniversary. But that does not make them unmarried. Just because they can't remember the day, that doesn't make them unfaithful. And so just because you can't remember the day that you were baptized, that doesn't make you an unfaithful Christian. What matters is do you remember that you gave your life to Christ, that you're in covenant relationship with him, and have you been and are you being faithful? Revelation 10, 2.10 says, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. A covenant relationship with Christ is such a blessing. I mean, he picked me. And as you remember that picture of my beautiful wife, the Jesus Christ felt blessed when I chose to enter a covenant relationship with him. He was excited. And he made all this life and living possible. Wow. And yet, sometimes you and I consider trying another way. Why in the world? Why would we, at times, consider trying another way? Is there something better than being married to Christ? How unwise. Why would I question the blessing of being with God? And yet, it happens. Not just for me, not just for you. It's happened for all of God's people all through the years. In fact, one of the big stories of the Old Testament is this story. So go in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to start there, and we're going to take some time to, to just look at this story as told through Jeremiah chapter 2. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we read, The word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. And God is saying, you might have, children of Israel, y'all might have forgotten that we're married. You've forgotten our anniversary, but I have not, God says. I remember the day of our anniversary, when we started this covenant in, at, in Sinai. I remember that day. And what it was like and how you said yes. And I remember those early years of walking through a wilderness where we, th together, we chose to do life together. God says, I remember when, I remember where, I remember all the little details of the day. He continues in verse 5. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me, that they strayed so far from me. They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. He remembered, but his people that entered into covenant with him thought, you know what, as we're walking this journey of life, look around us. That kind of looks interesting, attractive. And so they walked away from God. They looked at God and they looked at the world around them and they chose to walk away. They were following idols, following their way. And God describes it when you did that, you followed worthless idols. And when you follow a worthless idol and you come alongside it and join yourself with us, what does 
What do you become? Worthless. You became worthless yourself. Literally, that word could be translated nothingless. You followed nothingless idols. I mean, what's an idol? It's nothing. It's just something made. And in following it, you become like what it is, nothing. So if I pursue meaningless relationships in life and become one with them, that means I live a meaningless life. And that's what they chose to do. God continues to talk about this following his way. Verse 6, they did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. What can God do? He can take us through places where no one can travel and no one can live. And yet we do travel and we do live through those spaces in life because we have God with us. He helps us go where no one can go alone. So my question is, how does, how does somebody survive without God? He continued with a description of that relationship with him when he said in verse 7, I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. I mean, this speaks very clearly to what God provided for them and to us today in relationship with him. He says, first, I brought you into a fertile land. What that, that means is I brought you into a place of hope because in the future you're going to have needs. And in this space, in this place, you can grow what you need to survive. So I brought you where you can have hope to make it through all the tomorrows you have, all the future needs. But he said, I didn't just bring you here because of what you might need in the future. I also brought you here. I am with you because of what you need today. To eat its fruit and rich produce. That's today's fruit. God gives us what we need to sustain life and living in relationship with him today. But he also provides what we need in this fertile land of relationship with him in our future. What a beautiful blessing. How'd you get that with worthless relationships, with worthless idols? This is what I gave, and then he continues in verse 7. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. In other words, you didn't appreciate what you were given. For many of us, that includes the church. When we became Christians, he added us to the church, which helps us find what we need for this day, to live in this day, but not just now. It's the fertile ground in which he helps provide what we need for our tomorrows. And yet, for many of us, we don't appreciate that. You made my inheritance detestable. You didn't accept it. Wow. He continues in verse 11 with some pretty powerful statements. He says, you compared yourself with the world and you picked the world. Let me tell you about the world. Verse 11. Has any nation ever traded its gods for, a new, for new ones, even though they are not gods at all? I mean, you talked about these worthless idols. People don't even do what you did those of you who entered in covenant relationship with me. Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for nothingless, for worthless idols. I'm telling you what, I did honestly, truthfully think about walking away from Brenda. But I took a look at her and I took a look at me and I stayed fast. And it's, it's true, me, you, for most of us, we thought about walking away from God. I'd encourage you to take a look at yourself and take a look at God and where are you going to go? And if and when we walk away, wow. That's a... That's a significant decision that... Sorry, it just makes me want to shudder a little bit. Look at verse 12. Exchange their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with horror, declares the Lord. I mean, when, when people are in covenant relationship with God and they, they look at the world 
and they choose to follow it, it makes the heavens shudder. In, in a sense, you could say it makes the heavens get hair stand on end. In fact, literally, you could translate that phrase, uh, let your hair stand on end. It is a hair-raising decision to choose to walk away from God. Wow. And, and then God goes on through Jeremiah to point out specifically what this means. He says in verse 13, my people have committed two sins. He emphasizes two sins. Let's look at what he emphasizes. Number one, they have forsaken living water. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. Now, in, in the world that Jeremiah is speaking, this is a very powerful metaphor or illustration. I think it's powerful for us today, but in that world, it's even more so. If we need water, we just turn on a, a faucet, and we have water almost always, so it's not that big of a deal. But in that day and age, water in that culture was huge. It was a big deal. And to get water, they would dig a well until they came to the, the stream underneath, the living water, the, the water source down deep. And if you dug the well deep enough and tapped into that living water, the well never ran dry. It was always there for you. And so what God says, I was that living water, the flowing water that is never stale, it is not stagnant, it is not murky or muddy or yucky, it, it, it's a living water that will always be there to sustain your life. Awesome. And yet you had that and you said, you know what though, I think I would like to go over here and I am going to get my water source over here, except there's not really any water here, so I'm going to have to fake it and make it. So you dug a cistern. Now, in most of that ground, it would be limestone, which is very porous. So I dig a cistern, and I'm going to have to put plaster around the sides of it because, so the water will actually stay in it. And then I'm going to have to figure out how to get water into that cistern in this high place or this desert place, and the only source of water, because I'm not tapped into it, is rainfall. So I've got to try and channel the rain there. Hey, this is really nice. I get to be in a different place, and I have water to sustain life until a drought comes. But even that, he says, you, you dug it, you built it, you, and yet it's cracked. So any water that does come in, any blessing that flows into it doesn't stay. It falls through the, the crack. And so he, he said, you forsook, you walked away from this living water to something that's broken and not sustainable. You have forsaken the spring of living water. You have forsaken me. And you've made for yourself your own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Wow. Not even tapped into a water source. Just run off. How foolish. How w would I ever swap a living, the living water from a well for a cistern. So not only did they forsake it, forsake him, they replaced him with something inferior and broken. Now this is a common theme. For some of us here today, this is where we find ourselves right now. Living off of a broken cistern. And we're dry and in a drought, but you're here today. I just say you're not alone. Everybody sitting around you has been there. And all God's people have struggled with this. In a very real sense, the children of Israel that we read about so much are the first fruits of God. They, they were the first fruits given. They were supposed to be a blessing, an offering to him, and then share that blessing around. And yet, how many times did they fail? The, the Old Testament tells us over and over again. We're going to swap Old Testament passages and go to, to uh, Isaiah 43. Another one of my favorite passages that you hear me quote way too often. Isaiah 43. So Isaiah 42 tells the story of the children of Israel again and how they've wandered away and they've forsaken God and how they turned blind and deaf to his presence and the, the power of his re relationship. And in return, they found themselves living off broken cisterns, which means their life was dry and and and, and hard, and they found destruction in that place. And so he describes that in chapter 42, and then first, chapter 43 begins with these two words, but now. 
but now. And he's going to make a different point with, these, with his children. And he says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, does, do not fear, for I have redeemed you, I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When we put on Christ in baptism, as Christians, as followers of his, we are redeemed and we are his. And he is saying, I created you, I know you, I formed you, and I have redeemed you. God's message here to his children is if they will remember their anniversary, no, no, if they will remember their vows, he will redeem them. And he, he doesn't just stop there. He says, I have summoned you by name. Today, in a very powerful way, I think God's message to you is he knows your name. And while I can't say your name, he is saying that to you. He is calling you by name. He knows you. And he's saying, you are mine. I know what's happened. But now, remember, I do, do you. And then he says, this is what life together redeemed again can be. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. He doesn't say that in the days ahead, you're not going to have any times where you feel like you're in over your head. That's not what he's saying. He's just saying, remember. And for these folks, remember what happened in Egypt. They came out of Egypt. They were headed to the promised land. They came to a cul-de-sac of life. They couldn't go forward because of the, the sea. They couldn't go backward because of the Egyptian. And God took them through the waters because he was with them. And the gospel in a sentence is, I am with you. Emmanuel. God with us. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. God with us. I will be with you. Continue. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. I like to think of this as being in over my head, and I've been there many, many times. And he says, when life is going so fast and so much is coming at you that you feel like you're going to be swept off your feet and pushed downstream, he says, I will be with you and I will hold firm. You can stand. You can keep your footing in the midst of all that is going on. I am with you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. I can't help but think of those Hebrew hero, heroes in Daniel chapter 3 who went into that fiery furnace. And I don't know if they claimed this promise, but they lived it as an example for us. And there are times in this world where the heat is on. I mean, the pressure's there. And we feel like we're about to burn up or, be, or the world's going to burn us out. And God says, I will be with you. It will be hot. The heat will be there, but I will be with you. They will not set you ablaze. Why? For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You're not going through it alone. Whatever it is, you, it doesn't have to overwhelm you. God wants to be with you. And he did that. He made all that possible through Jesus. He describes what he did for us through Jesus, our Savior, just a little bit later in the chapter, Isaiah 43, verse 24. You have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Yep. That's us. We burden God with our sins. And Jesus took that burden to the cross. And he forgave us for God's sake. And because of Jesus, he can remember our sins no more. That means we can be with God. And God can be with us forever. Wow, that's some pretty good news. Why would I even consider trading allegiance with God to pursue anything in this world? Why would I even think about it? 
A lot of us old timers remember an old TV show. It's a game show that was called Let's Make a Deal. I don't know, it might still be on today, but I definitely remember it back in, in the day. And uh, it was, a, it was a, a deal, you know. So you, here's what you got in hand. And there are three curtains that you don't know what's behind. You're going to keep this or you're going to trade it for the unknown. <laughs> this is not let's make a deal. And the biggest thing that's different about our life is there are no curtains up there. I mean, you can see it clear as day. God has revealed to us what it looks like. And so the choice is ours. It's, you would think the option is obvious, but it's not. Are you going to choose living water or broken cisterns filled with nothing that quenches our thirst just filled with sediment and mire. The call is to give our lives to God. Proverbs 3.3, 3, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So for those of us who are Christians, God might be speaking to us and say, it's time to be restored to relationship with him. If you walked away, it's time to come home. Remember the covenant that you agreed to. God does. Will you? In our relationships, we are never perfect. In my marriage, I haven't been a perfect husband. I haven't been, am not, and never will be. And with God, I haven't been a perfect child. Never was, am not, never will be. But this I can tell you. I will be and I can be faithful. I will be faithful. Not perfect, but I will be faithful. No walking away. No replacing God is faithful. Will I be? We're going to sing an invitation song. And during the song, a couple of our shepherds are going to make their way back to the parlor. It's just a room right back here. You can go out any door and make your way there. They'd love to receive you there and pray for you. Or you can respond publicly here. Brother and sister in Christ, maybe it's your time to remember. The call was never to be perfect. You have a perfect Savior. Be faithful, and if we can help you, we'd love to do so. If you've never put on Christ in baptism, maybe now is the time. I hope you'll think about it. We have been very honest and clear about the covenant. We're not perfect people. The goal is to be faithful people. And may this be a day, April 2nd, 2023, that you can call out into the future, the day you entered into covenant relationship with God. We're going to sing the song, I Am Resolved, internally or publicly. I hope you'll respond. Let's stand together and sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight, things that are hard.